Welcome to the channel. My name is Sammy Barlos, and here we talk about network and cybersecurity. We'll talk about 40 EDR a little bit today, some of the things that come up when I'm talking to industry professionals. Before we get started, though, any opinions in this video are my own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of past, present, or future employers. I want to put that out there. Um, I do this on my own time. So, quick agenda we're going to talk about fabric integrations, which is a key component of many Fortinet products. EDR versus XDR, what the differences are there specifically in Fortinet's lineup. Um, it, it should be general to the industry, but uh, we'll be touching specifically on uh, what Fortinet means. And then uh, for the EDR process flow, so we'll detail all the nitty gritty of how that looks like. So our first thing, security fabric integration. So we're going to leverage the security fabric, and there are some third-party integrations that I'll mention as well. Uh, the first thing is the FortiGate, obviously. Can send IP addresses from EDR to FortiGate. Uh, this would have been really helpful when I was a customer. I had the EDR platform, and it didn't do this. It didn't have this integration. So my security guy, he would send me a list of IP addresses. I would manually enter them into the FortiGate uh, because I was a Forti FortiGate customer, um, and that took you know maybe an hour or two a week, right? Uh, taking IP addresses, putting them in another system, verifying everything. Um, it was cumbersome, right? So big integration that I would have loved to have when I was on the customer side. We can also leverage NAC to go ahead and put it in remediation VLAN. I like to have layers of security. So uh, not only isolating at the collector, which is the endpoint agent when we talk about Forti EDR, as well as at the network layer, right? With Forti NAC, leveraging switches and VLANs to segment it. It's just another layer of protection there. For the sandbox, we can submit those suspicious files to support a sandbox. We can send events and alerts to FortiSim. Of course, FortiGuard Labs, the threat intelligence is native to Forti EDR. Uh, and then lastly here, this is relatively new. Uh, Fortinet has added ZTNA uh, capabilities into EDR. So now EDR can integrate with EMS and it can send information in order to build those ZTNA tags. So if you're leveraging ZTNA or you look to leverage ZTNA in the future, uh, you can also leverage the information from EDR to make those ZTNA decisions. So when it comes to EDR versus XDR, we're really going to focus on this last column and really this last little section here that's titled XDR. Well, that's helpful. Uh, and you'll see that it's called extended detection and response. And uh, this kind of frustrates me because it's really extended detection. It's not extended response. Extended response is right here in every single offering by Fortinet. So why did we call it extended detection and response instead of just extended detection? I don't know. Uh, but here we are. So really, when we're talking about Forta XDR, we're going to talk detection across the security fabric. Now, this is native integration with the Forta Analyzer. So it's not like some other XDR solutions where you have to re-ingest all your data into their proprietary, uh, essentially SIM platform, uh, and pay for that separately. We're able to integrate with the existing logs. We're not pulling logs. We don't have a different database. We don't have all this other extra cost, right? We're just analyzing the logs. We also integrate with AWS and Google. So if you're a Google or AWS cloud user, we integrate there as well. Now, jumping up here, one thing I just want to touch on really quickly with this EDR light, um, you miss a lot of the EDR features, namely uh, some detailed logging and threat hunting. Uh, now this really devalues uh, EDR as a whole. You'll see that it says EPP slash EDR light because really not classified as EDR because the big, big differentiator between next-gen AV and EDR is this threat hunting capabilities. It's, you know, IOC ingestion and search kind of capability. Um, and you'll look, if you're going for a managed solution, you lose a ton of managed functionality here on the EDR Lite version. So I typically don't recommend this. Um, if you want an actual EDR product, we'll be looking at the, uh, what they call standard EDR here, or EDR, because it is EDR. Uh, this actually by definition is not EDR. So that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, not only with Fortinet, but with other vendors as well. Um, they typically have an EDR light offering uh, that is going to be hitched like it is EDR when it's really not EDR. So um, just, you know, whether you're talking to Fortinet or someone else, you know, make sure you understand the capabilities that you're getting um, at the end of the day for the particular license that you're actually purchasing uh, because sometimes things get mixed up and 
you know, they talk to you about features that are available in EDR, but then they quoted you EDR Lite. I had that happen when I was a customer, not a Fortinet, another vendor, but uh, I digress. Now with that, jump over here to the whiteboard. We're gonna talk a little bit about the process flow with EDR. <clears throat> so with really any EDR, the first thing that's gonna happen is there's gonna be some kind of execution, right? So maybe it'll be a Word document, uh, Excel file, maybe it'll be a .exe, right, whatever. Now that is gonna start off the process. And just about any EDR is going to have a next-gen AV component. So it's kind of a core component of EDR. If they're calling it EDR and they don't have next-gen AV, I'd be very, very concerned uh, about what else they're telling me. <clears throat> and most EDRs, uh, I believe all EDRs should have this, they have an additional cloud layer. Now, in Fortinet's world, that's uh, FortiGuard Cloud Services, uh, and that's going to do an additional check, right? So we're doing next-gen AV locally on the box. So if there's no internet connection, whatever, we still have that, you know, the vast majority of the protection. But there's an additional layer of, yeah, let's double check this. Let's make sure, let's correlate this with other information that we have that just isn't available on-prem in the cloud to get that additional um, kind of verification. So <clears throat> not only do does 40 EDR do that, but one of the key components in the next-gen AV that makes 40 EDR different is kernel-level integration. And you're probably asking, well, why does that really matter? I mean, yeah, maybe there's a few things that inject themselves into the kernel. Uh, but it's really like super advanced persistent threat kind of stuff. So eh, maybe we're not too worried about that. Eh, it doesn't really matter. But that's not actually the biggest benefit that comes from kernel level integration. We'll talk about that. This is going to be an oversimplified version of the operating system. But over here, we have the user space, which is where you know, we actually run our applications. We have our kernel, and I know there's more here. I'm not gonna, you know, for the sake of this conversation. We have the user level, we have the kernel level, we have the hardware. So at the user level, we're doing process injection. Now, Fortinet does this with their EPP product, uh, the FortiClient EPP APT. They leverage process injection in order to run their next generation antivirus. Right. In contrast to, to 40 EDR, and we'll talk about that in just a second, the details. I think that all other EDR vendors are using the process injection method. I don't know of any other that are using anything else. Uh, if there are, correct me in the comments. Nice to know. Uh, but I believe they're all using process injection. And essentially what we're doing is the same thing that malicious actors are doing, right? We're injecting our code into another process. Now, usually with threat actors and with, uh, you know, cheats from, from games back in the day, uh, we would only inject into one application, right? But in order for NextGen AV to be effective, right, we have to inject into just about every, if not every, application. So then we start having concerns around performance. I'm going to put that over here, performance. So when we start having concerns about performance, what do we do? Well, I've had some customers that came to me and said, I have XYZ uh, EDR platform and it's eating up you know, double digits of CPU, 10, 15, 20% CPU. And I've either got to buy a new EDR or I've got to buy a new computer. And in other cases, EDR vendors are not actually doing the process injection with all processes. Now, hopefully that EDR vendor, they're doing their due diligence they're being very selective in the processes that they are injecting into, um, you know, and they're they're going to catch the vast majority of threats, right? Obviously, you know, we're going to inject into the Word Word document process because a lot of phishing attempts go through Microsoft Word, right? So, uh, whereas some of the other uh, system processes or some really specific one for your organization, it's not common, right? It's pretty rare, you know, to go through maybe. Um, you know, a, a computer-aided dispatch system, a CAD system, right? You know, oh, that's really only in, um, you know, a first responder kind of networks. It would be pretty rare for a threat actor to, to attack that particular um, solution, that particular application, that particular process. 
Uh, more than likely, they're going to go into like a system process or they're going to go into a common thing like, you know, Microsoft Word that pretty much everyone is using. So maybe they're making some selective decisions there, but the reality of it is we're not going to look at 100%. The kernel level integration performance is not a concern. Therefore, we can see 100% of every bit and byte going across the kernel. Now, that's helpful in another way as well. When we start talking about ransomware prevention, which I'll try not to get ahead of myself here. Uh, we're able to actually stop it live in real time at the kernel before it actually writes to the hardware. That can be super, super valuable. Um, instead of dealing with, hey, you know, we stopped ransomware halfway through. Now we stopped it before it actually wrote to the hard drive, before it actually did anything, before it actually made any connections. So um, really what we've gotten to so far, this is pre-execution, is what we call it at Fortinet, the pre-execution phase. And now we're going to go into the post-execution phase. So we'll split off into multiple different sections here. Uh, the first thing we're going to look at is if we're making an external connection, then we'll have our exfiltration policy. So the exfiltration policy, of course, looks for any outgoing connections. We have that kernel level integration, right? So we're looking at everything from the kernel's perspective. Any external connection, we're going to look for PII. We're going to look for IP, right? Uh, in my vertical, uh, you know, serving local governments and school districts, typically, you know, we don't have intellectual property. But, you know, in the business world, they, they do, right? So uh, we're looking for that kind of information in that external connection, uh, and we'll be able to uh, block it there blocked communication. And also, you know, if we have any encryption, then we'll go to the anti-ransomware. And uh, so basically, uh, we're looking for any encryption. Now, we'll notice things like BitLocker, right? We expect BitLocker to do encryption. That's normal. That's expected. Pretty much any other encryption going through the kernel trying to write to disk and it's probably ransomware <clears throat> once we get through those we have a last phase we call communication and control now here's the buzzword in lots of marketing material don't call it communication control call it virtual patching why in the world do we call it virtual patching? What does it actually mean? That's a great question. It's a question I had that I dug into and I've distilled it just for you. So we talk about virtual patching. There's a few different options we have with communication control. I'm going to zoom out a little bit and then we're going to get into it. So we can specify particular vendors, for example. So maybe we have TeamViewer. We don't ever use TeamViewer. We don't have any contractors that use TeamViewer. We're going to go ahead and block TeamViewer. It's used by a lot of you know, phishing attempts and a lot of kind of uh, people we don't want in our network, right? Maybe someone's trying to download it and remote in from home outside of our, you know, remote access policies, for example. So we can go and block by vendor, right? Any team viewer or that particular application or a particular version of that application, if you want to get really, really specific, we have those options there in communication control. The virtual patching really comes in when we start talking about CVEs. And of course, we have critical CVEs, you know, we have high CVEs, et cetera, et cetera, right? But let's just say we're worried about critical and high. So we can create a communication control policy, which is implementing this virtual patching that says, hey, if you notice any CVEs high or above, let's go ahead and enact communication control and block communication. So great example, um, you know, the company that never has any vulnerabilities, Adobe. Uh, so maybe you have Adobe Acrobat or Adobe Reader, and you want to open a PDF. A vulnerability comes out higher critical, so we go ahead and turn on communication control and block any external communication. So what happens, the user goes and opens the PDF. Well, if the PDF is local, there's no need for communication. The application still functions. The application still launches, it opens the PDF. Everything's great. But we've essentially virtually patched until we can get a patch from the vendor, or you know maybe we can get two patching, right? Uh, in some large environments, it's kind of difficult. You can't just, hey, you know, on a Tuesday, just 
push out a patch to everybody. Um, I had a situation where uh, where we literally saturated WAN links because of patches being pushed out. Um, true mediate threats. All good stuff, right? I mean, we were supposed to patch. We need to patch. That's all great. Um, but we need to slow down a little bit and and uh, coordinate a little bit better on that particular situation. Um, when all of a sudden things start working slowly, I start digging into logs, start digging into telemetry data, uh, start looking at the uh, FortiGate GUI and going, eh, why is this WAN link saturated? And uh, starting in the Fort Analyzer, find out why. Uh, and we found out it was it was patches. I think it was for Adobe, actually, um, if I recall correctly. But uh, yeah, so that's kind of like the overview. So we've got the pre-execution phase. Again, that key component is that kernel level integration. We can see 100% of everything. Oh, one thing I didn't note, speaking of 100%. The uh, communication is 100% configurable, so if you don't want to use it, you don't have to. Uh, you can set it to your liking. So to sum up, we have this kernel level integration. We have additional checks if any external communication or encryption is going on. And then thirdly, we have the communication control if maybe we have an application that we don't want to communicate with anything, or we have a critical vulnerability, whether there's a patch out or not. Um, so we can do that virtual patching. So that sums up um, really the most common things that I usually discuss when I'm talking about EDR with people in the industry. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful for you and uh, I'll see you in the next one.